Hey everybody, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Carruthers from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, who's been doing a lot of awesome work for like decades now on like really, really large scale discrete event simulation that's, you know, planetary scale. Um, so yeah, he'll be telling us about how that stuff works and what it's used for. Thanks, Chris. All right, th thanks so much, Greg. I really appreciate it. And, and thanks for everybody joining. Um, so as Greg said, I'm gonna be talking about our simulator called ROS and some of the results we've had in modeling really some extreme scale computer systems, um, but it's not just limited to computer systems as you'll see uh, throughout this talk. I'll go ahead and point out if you're interested in ROS at all, you can go to our GitHub repo on github.com slash ROS.org slash ROS. It's right there. And I did send Greg my slides. So you know anything that you didn't miss or you know, you're trying to write something down, they're in the PDF form of the slides. Um, let's see. So motivation, why, why are we interested again in, in PDIS, Parallel Discrete Event Simulation? Um, as you're probably well aware, again, large scale systems are really, really difficult to understand um, and uh, can be very challenging. And so um, uh, that's sort of one aspect of it. The other aspect, if we try to do any sort of analytical mathematical model, they can tend to be um, overly constrained and not really representative of the real world. Uh, that we wish to model. And so then ultimately, uh, PDIS or Parallel Discrete Event Simulation offers us the ability, as you're gonna see, to dramatically shrink uh, the execution of a model's time. Um, and then that's gonna in turn open up a really dramatic capability in terms of doing what if analysis. So you can ask questions about a system that you wouldn't think you could otherwise. And in fact, um, sort of a little foreshadowing, you can basically avoid maybe having to build near real model, real physical models of things, physical models and networks or computer systems, at least initially, um, and get a lot of um, results from your uh, parallel discrete event model that you've done. And so example models we that have been modeled before, not necessarily always by me, but many of these examples were the entire national airspace, for example. Uh, you can do whole internet backbones, content ca caches, and of course, I've done a lot of work actually in modeling next generation supercomputer systems, and then there's been other models uh, as well. So let's just start with an example and sort of drive this home um, and sort of a simplistic example, uh, but if you were trying to do modeling over of, of downloading movies over the internet, let's say you're doing some content distribution, and we'll just even do a simple model where we're saying, you know, you've got some million home uh, subscribers uh, um, all trying to download a movie. Let's say it's a four gigabyte HD movie, not particularly big. It's not even, a, you know, a 4K style movie. It's a, say, older movie. Um, and so then if you start doing the back math, you quickly uh, see that doing such a model at a packet level becomes unwieldy for most, for really sequential simulation um, at a discrete event level. So if we look at your nominal sequential simulator for a model of this scale might run around 200,000 events per second. Maybe you can goose it up a bit, overclocking and things like that, but generally speaking, you're gonna be limited there. If we make some assumptions about such a model, right, say eight packet hops, uh, and you've got something like um, 4 trillion 1K packets, um, so you end up, if you're doing every hop in the network, you end up with a 32 trillion event uh, system and you very quickly see you need about five years to model that which is completely unacceptable and you couldn't even run it more than once. So again ultimately parallel simulation is needed to effectively make this uh, type of model uh, much more tractable. All right so I'm going to provide sort of an outline for the rest of this talk in terms of I'm going to give an overview of PDIS. I think probably I'll go quickly through it but um, just in case there's folks in here who haven't seen in that type of modeling before, it might be beneficial. But then I'm gonna talk about uh, parallel discrete event uh, schemes, in particular time warp. And then I'm gonna talk about our really cool spin on time warp where we use this thing called reverse computation to actually make it run faster. So in fact, we run things backwards to make them run faster. It sounds counterintuitive, but you'll see what I mean shortly. Um, then we'll talk about the implementation of ROS and performance results. And then we're gonna see a couple of applications that we've been using for ROS, one called Codes, which has been a long, uh, over probably nearly a decade project we've had with the Department of Energy in modeling uh, extreme, scale si extreme scale systems. And then finally, uh, the second application is in neuromorphic processor design, uh, one, and that simulator is called NEMO. 
And then I'll conclude with really some uh, future directions. All right, so discrete event systems, and, and this is sort of the high level view where you've got some model uh, specified in terms of ultimately events where um, you've divided up the space of your physical system and you can define what the state variables are. Um, and then you've sort of eventized each of those sort of changes in state behavior and things like that. So that becomes sort of your sort of application, if you will, at the top level. And then at the bottom level, you have a simulation engine. It could be parallel or serial, um, but you have sort of the same major components, which are largely eventless management and then sort of managing time advance. So those are really the two things. And the way it sort of works is the you register with the, the application registers with the simulation uh, ex, uh, engine sort of uh, pointers to functions specifically, but ultimately event handlers um, that the simulation executive calls on its behalf. And so you end up with this sort of two-way interface uh, between the simulation application and the simulation uh, engine itself. Um, so let's look at an example here where we're going to do um, an air traffic. That was one of the first examples uh, I mentioned. So we can talk about doing a simple air traffic model where we've got aircraft arriving, landing, and departing. And again, this won't be in parallel. We're just going to be doing the core serial, but you'll get a sense of this. And in fact, there's actually some interesting um, key points and takeaways, even from this simple example, I'll, I'll make sure to point out. Um, so here's an example where we've got, you know, arrival events at eight o'clock, which in turn, the arrival event is going to be scheduling a landing event, which then just schedules a departure event. And that's sort of interesting because you can have your events then sort of self-schedule or schedule other things to happen, which it might not be obvious to do that, but that's sort of how the uh, event flow mechanism works in discrete event. Um, and so then the idea here under the covers is that our unprocessed events um, are stored in a pending event list. And events, and this is sort of the sacrosanct, do not violate sort of premise in discrete event simulation is you must process your events in timestamp order. Now you can weaken that sometimes, but generally speaking, you wanna make sure that you uh, uh, adhere to that, uh, that constraint. All right, so this is the event oriented view of the world, right? Where we then declare our arrival and Ross actually pretty much is implemented this way where you declare your event handler procedures register them with the simulation executive. In this case, we, we have an arrival event, a landing event, and a departure event. And then you have your state variables declared up there. Um, you'll see in a second, we call, we'll decompose the model. So if we have multiple airports, we would map them to simulation entities. We call those logical processes. But let's just say we have one airport we're modeling here. So we'll effectively have only one logical process. But again, under the covers, and your simulation engine, of course, you want to make sure that you're simulating things in timestamp order. So you're always going to remove the smallest event from your pending event list. Um, and then you're going to ultimately increment what the notion of time now is based on the timestamp of that smallest unprocessed event. And then we're going to ultimately invoke the event handler that goes with that event, which could have been any one of those event handlers specified in the um, upper level application. All right. So this gives sort of the, the overall model of the, the airport. So we have these constants that we define. In this case, they could be distributions, by the way. So you could have some exponential or other distribution you're using for your runway time. But for this purposes, we'll say that they're going to be constants. So R is the runway time. I mean, time on the runway. G is the time on the ground. Then we have these other state variables where now is the current simulation time. In the air is the number of aircraft in the air. On the ground is the number on the ground. And there's a Boolean, is the runway free or not? And as I specified earlier, we have our particular uh, model events. Um, so if we look at just the, the first arrival um, uh, event, we sort, of, we sort of do something interesting. In this case, in this model, we really don't care what aircraft are here. Where aircraft could be any aircraft is, is good. It doesn't matter in this model, as long as we're just you know, making sure we're, we're accounting for which aircraft are in the air and are they on the ground. That's all we're sort of saying here. And so we can make some simplifying assumptions here where we'll have an arrival event then can schedule its own landing event. Um, or we'll see later on that the departure event can actually schedule uh, uh, other events as well. So so this is sort of uh, one of the, the tricks that we can do with the trade is 
once you understand what you're trying to model, you can sort of play fast and loose with reality a little bit um, and gain some performance in doing so. So in this case, we'll have our in the air variable that gets incremented and we say, if the runway is free, then we'll go ahead and schedule the landing event for our arrival. So, and we'll say it's at time now plus, plus R. So I think that that's uh, fairly, fairly easy. But now here's where it gets interesting, um, where what we're gonna do is when we're on the landing event, once um, an aircraft has landed, because in the previous arrival, right, we just incremented because the runway now was busy in the arrival. So now what actually happens is we'll go ahead and increment on the ground and, and schedule our own departure event once we've landed, but then we'll actually then as, we've processed our own landing event, the part of that is gonna then look at the in the air variable and say, oh, are there other planes in the air? Then we're gonna schedule the landing event for those other planes at time now plus R. Notice we're not caring what plane we're dealing with here. And again, that's part of an optimization that you can make depending on what, what you're wanting to model here. If we had to track all the planes and we'd have to have a queue for it and so on and so forth. So this is just to make the model simpler, but it also makes it, um, uh, potentially uh, perform much faster. Um, now, if in the air it turns out to be zero, it's all free, then finally the runway variable will be set to uh, true. And then when the next arrival happens, it'll just automatically fall through and schedule its own uh, landing event. Um, but this is what's happening uh, for this model. And then the departure event's very easy. We just say on the ground equals uh, on the ground minus one. So then if we look at this whole time flow, you get a sense of this where we can have a couple of planes coming in, one at time one and three. The arrival of F1 then schedules its own landing um, um, event, or so they're, they come in, they're actually time zero. So then we'll process the arrival of F1, which then causes the schedule of the landing of F1. Um, and then you kind of get this sort of progression of all the events as they flow through, where once F1 is landed, then it schedules its own departed at time eight. Um, and then finally, it um, it will ultimately uh, will process its own depart event, um, and then we'll um, finally process the departure of F two. So you so again, I'm just sort of giving you a, a high level feel for how this goes. You can walk through some of these details uh, on your own, but I just want to give a, a feeling for this. And you can see above, you can see actually how at certain time points the actual state variables transition, where in the air starts off as zero. It goes to one to two um, at three, so that's the number of planes, and then it gets decremented at four because we processed a landing event and so on and so forth. So you get a feel for the time flow mechanism and what's happening. And again, in discrete event, nothing happens between time. It only happens at the actual processing of the event, which is sometimes, uh, if you're coming from a continuous background, that gets hard to think about, meaning everything happens at time now that we're currently dealing with. Okay. Um, so again, the quick summary, right, is, you know, these discrete event uh, computations are going to be some sequence of events. Uh, we're modifying our state variables and scheduling new events. Um, and that you have this interesting, you know, application at the top level and you can exchange or register event handlers from the application and the executive. And so they have sort of a, uh, the, the simulation executive keeps track of all of the pending event lists and, and sort of time, if you will, while the actual application manages really the processing and how each of those events are going to be processed. All right. So now let's look at uh, the next topic, which is time warp and, and sort of other PDIS schemes. We'll just sort of touch on them. Um, so the first question then is, so given what I just talked about with discrete event, you can imagine you have multiple airports now that you want to now run in parallel. I'd love to for each airport, assign it to um, some independent uh, processor and then process airports in parallel. So then the question then you really immediately run into is a synchronization problem, right? All right, so uh, anytime you have a synchronization problem, you can sort of whip out your parallel computing book and you can kind of say, well, how would we do this? Um, maybe you run immediately into some sort of lockstep execution approach using a barrier. So um, on the graph on the left, you could say, well, I've got all these uh, processors, so what we'll do is we'll um, barrier synchronization at the end of processing events across all my processors, 
and do that throughout virtual time. However, the problem with that is, is it assumes that you've got a very dense um, set of events throughout virtual time. And so what we see in most applications is um, events want to happen at the time that they're sort of programmed to happen, especially if you have any sort of stochastic distribution, uh, say exponential, for example, events can happen um, really at, at largely any time and they're all not necessarily happening at the same time. So this parallel uh, lockstep execution doesn't work so well uh, because it, the uh, discrete event uh, system itself tends to be very sparse with respect to virtual time. Meaning, if I look at any one uh, sort of bucketing of time, I don't have that many events to process. So, how can we how can we deal with this? So, the solution's been uh, this approach called time warp, where we're just going to allow synchronization to sort of break loose and run things sort of unsynchronized, and then we're going to have to use the time warp mechanism to sort of solve a problem that it's sort of creating by dealing with an unsynchronized set of calculations running across processors. And the key problem is this events arriving in the past, right? And so you get this notion of what's called a straggler event. And so then the solution, of course, is the time warp uh, algorithm itself. Um, and the way we can divide up this algorithm is largely into two pieces. It has a local control mechanism and a global control mechanism. So the first piece is, and we've introduced a new term here, so we shifted from processing elements or PEs to LPs or logical processes. So things, the, uh, things in green are the process events, things in red are gonna be a straggler event or an event arriving in the past. Um, and then um, as you'll see, on, we'll get to the, the right panel in a minute. So the, the first problem with the local control mechanism is it's really an error detection or a causality detection and rollback mechanism. It's sort of saying, hey, um, are events being processed in timestamp order? And if not, we need to fix them up. And so then, uh, we're seeing an example here where LP1 sends a, an event in the past of LP2, noted in red. And then because LP2 had advanced in virtual time and processed events that were ahead of where LP, uh, where that event in red was in virtual time, now we have to sort of roll that event back or undo it. Um, and so that causes sort of two things that we have to do. To actually roll the event back, we have to undo any state changes that happened as a consequence of processing that event. So those state variables I mentioned earlier, they need to be undone. And then we have to sort of cancel any events that were scheduled. So if you remember like the landing event, the arrival event could schedule a landing event. If we were doing that in parallel, we would have to send out a cancellation and, 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 and squash that event. And we can in fact do that in time warp, it's actually called sending an anti-message after um, and it kind of goes along the idea of, of matter and antimatter. If an anti-message uh, connects with its corresponding positive message um, on the uh, LP, its destination for it, they cancel each other out. So that's what's uh, supposed to happen. So that's the first part. But a part of this uh, uh, algorithm is we're undoing state changes, which implies we had to do state saving, which I'll talk a lot more about uh, shortly. But we had to do state saving to allow us to be able to support the rollback mechanism to begin with. So that means we've got this ever growing set of states uh, that we're keeping around. And so we have to have the ability to sort of collect up that state and reuse it in sort of future uh, events of the system as well as the, the logical process state as well. So for that, we use the global control mechanism where we define this notion of global virtual time, which is a lower bound on all uh, processed events or partially processed events or even any IO uh, that's been done. And the bottom line here is that anything less than GVT uh, can be fossil collected um, or garbage collected. And so then that's what we call a committed event. And so then we can reclaim that memory and use it in future unprocessed events. And so those two mechanisms work hand in hand where we are rolling back periodically and then we're also periodically computing global virtual time um, and uh, uh, garbage collecting things. So that's the time where a mechanism now that sounds at the first pass pretty expensive, pretty hard to support for massively parallel execution. So are there other options we should be considering? The other options tend to be conservative because they sort of disallow this out of order execution. So for example, you could use a global barrier synchronization approach. Um, in fact, the another approach, um, especially if you wanna do a distributed approach is the original null message algorithm by 
Chandy Misra and also co-developed by Bryant. So this null message algorithm sends essentially promise events around that sort of say, hey, I'm not gonna really be sending you a real event until sometime in the future. And you can use all that information to figure out when it's safe to process events. Um, there's also a form of where you just let things run until you get run into deadlock and then you re can recover from that. The bottom line with all of the conservative algorithms is they rely on the model's time increment mechanism, which we call that sort of look ahead, meaning it's, it's its ability to cast events into the future. If for some reason you introduce a new feature of your model, which changes the way you cast events in the future, and then by that I mean in time, you change the distribution, you change the average timestamp increment, anything, then suddenly your amazing parallel performance that you can get could potentially uh, go and fall off the edge of the world. Um, so we've actually sort of seen this uh, with many um, models. So the bottom line for most all parallel discrete event um, algorithms is there is no free lunch here. So one of the problems you run into with null messages um, in addition to having to send them and their overhead is you end up with this problem of a timestamp or we call a look ahead creep, where if you have, you can think of in networks, right? Networks are very fast. So they have a very low time between sending messages between say two elements in a network. So if you have that minimum time, you have to use the minimum time. That's sort of your notion of the look ahead in the model. But if you're not sending events all that often, then you could ultimately have a null message creep where you're sending messages in the system at very small increments when in fact what's happening in your overall model is something time time is flowing at a much higher level of scale. Um, so you can end up with just sending and processing a bunch of null messages in the system. The other problem is you can't have cycles allowed. So you can't send zero timestamp increment messages in general and you certainly can't do it around the cycle or dependency among a lot of LPs. Um, so essentially this look ahead is, is, is extremely needed for concurrent processing events. And if you don't have much of it in your model, you need to program your model in a particular way. So you start seeing the effects of, in the model, you see strange things in the model code because you're, you're programming for look ahead and not necessarily for what you want the model to do. Um, um, so how does so, the, the cost trade off, how does it relate to the, I guess the, communication structure of the model, or the, the causal structure of the model, how does it make some of these schemes more or less efficient? Oh, so, well, that's that's also interesting. So, the the again, when you start talking conservative, there's underlying assumption that you actually know the causal structure of the model to begin with. So, going in the door, you had to know exactly every, what the sort of communication paths of every LP could be or might be, and be prepared uh, for that. Um, so you would have to sort of take a worst case analysis of, well, I might get a message from uh, this logical process. And if you never did, you'd be sending null messages along paths anyway, um, because there's a chance that you won't, or there's a chance that you, you would do it. And so this also has a, a profound implication on the performance of, of the underlying conservative algorithm. Um, and then, of course, with deadlock detection, you always have to sit back and compute the smallest timestamp uh, event for safe for for safety purposes, which in fact is very much akin to commu uh, computing GVT anyway. Um, so, and what about so the, the I guess the, or, density, or, go ahead, like, Say uh, again. What about sparse? What about sparse causality versus dense causality? What does that have? Uh, what effect does that have in performance or scalability? I guess. So the good news, at least for time warp, is that um, um, the denser the, 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 the code is, the, the, the fewer rollbacks you get. In fact, you can have, if you have a very dense model, you can actually have zero timestamp increments and be supported no problem and actually not get a rollback. You could actually end up with a system where you, you run 100% efficient, as we say, meaning you incur zero rollbacks um, or nearly so. Um, we'll actually kind of see nearly an example of that um, scaling out as well. So again, the the, the denser the uh, model, and by event density too, I'm talking about having a large population of events to process. Um, and that actually has the effect of pulling, so the, the rate at which you each processor moves through simulated time is sort of retarded a bit, uh, re, sort of slowed a bit. And so then what happens is events that cross go from one core to another core or over the network, 
they're able to sort of get in and meet, uh, get in and, and be put in the priority queue before that logical process got to that point in simulated time. So it's a so there's a there's a really interesting um, sort of uh, dynamics that happens there. Uh, the rollback dynamics get interesting with that. Um, now, so let me start talking about with time warp in particular. Uh, state saving overheads were always considered sort of the bane of its existence. Um, they really, you, know, you could get really good, great efficiency, but if you actually looked at your speed up, it would be um, say less than n over two on n processors. So you didn't feel like you were getting the great speed up that you wanted. And so then the question is, how can we avoid some of these um, overhead and complexities? And this gets into sort of what I talked about earlier. Let's support this idea of reverse computation as opposed to state saving. Um, and see if we can't make things run a bit faster um, uh, in a funny way. And, and this idea actually came from Feynman le Feynman's lecture notes on computation um, some time ago when, when I was just sort of in a browsing in a Barnes and Noble, I think at the time, and uh, I got the book and I had sort of this aha moment that we could leverage what he was calling at the time reversible uh, computing or a computer to sort of solve some of the state saving uh, 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 overheads that we were seeing in time warp. And so um, the idea, and we, we continue to work towards this of automatically generating reverse code from model source. And then as opposed to doing state saving, we would actually just reverse execute events. So there'd be some uh, RC event handlers out there that uh, could be automatically generated. Um, and ultimately this lowers memory utilization because you're only, as we'll see, we'll only store a minimal amount of state changes, but everything else can be reverse computed, generally speaking, um, and have negligible overheads in the forward computation because we aren't doing just this bulk blind state saving and not worrying about really what do we need to do here. And so the idea was is we could have a compiler and generate modified code or reverse code here. So let's look at this a little more specifically, and this gives a more uh, concrete example. You can imagine you've got some network switch, right? And you've got a packet arrival. And so typically you have a queue length um, and an overall buffer size, and you'll do something in your original model. Well, queue length plus plus, and I have some number of delays. So for that particular uh, element of the queue, we'll add its delays. Otherwise we drop the packet, let's say. Um, so one of the things we can do is we can use some, some bit values to record which path we took through the actual processing of the forward event. So in this case, we'll introduce a bit variable B1 here um, and keep the code pretty much the same. Um, and we'll actually on the else clause have B0. And then the reverse comes pretty easy, right? We just say, well, which path did you take? If B equals one, then we'll decrement uh, both the delays and the queue length uh, variables. Otherwise, loss gets decremented. And we see this a lot in most uh, simulations. Uh, for discrete event models, especially in computer systems, they're pretty much tracking uh, statistics on things like packets and was this added or subtracted. In other words, the the operations tend to be very either additive, subtractive, or and we call it constructive is the more word we use. So there's not a lot of uh, just destruction of or entropy in the models per se that gets destroyed. There's just a lot of statistics that are kept about the model, and we can leverage that in this reverse computation. Um, so again, the benefits, we see a huge reduction in state. So before in um, time where we would just blindly store the whole buffer that is the uh, the uh, in, in the logical process that's modeling that switch. And so we would have some, you know, if B was 100, you would have just this a uh, huge amount of state, um, 100 you know, bytes or 100 integers of state, whereas we can reduce that down to really like one word in this case. So um, the other piece is we no longer have the huge overheads on the forward computation. We're kind of shifting them to the rollback phase. But again, if we can have sort of 99% efficient models, the rollback phase shouldn't hurt us too bad. And so we'll see lower memory increased speed. So let's look at a little bit more detailed. And the sort of the big idea we're, we're using here is that the control state of most models, most models, is much, much, much smaller than the data state. So we see that the size of the bit fields we're using to manage what, what is for else we took um, is much, much smaller than any of the state variables. And so, um, you know, how can we sort of leverage this? Uh, 
in a sort of systematic way. Um, there's other things that we can also do is, is support things like random number generation, which you'll actually see a, a cool example of that uh, coming up here as well. Um, just so you, you know, we, we've gone through and done the rules of automation and um, uh, we've actually have an initial compiler that we worked on called the rain, which is based off LLVM uh, and Clang, where we actually inserted a pass uh, in the, um, um, uh, uh, the compiler itself, which works off of the sort of intermediate representation uh, in the uh, Clang LLVM uh, infrastructure. And so then we can, uh, within ROS, we can generate uh, some of the uh, reverse code automatically from uh, given the forward code. Um, so that was actually an interesting project my student Justin Lepre worked on. There's been other activities as well. There's Backstroke, which the folks at Livermore worked on, um, which actually was going after supporting uh, C++ in its entirety. And in that case, they ultimately ended up with a little bit more state saving uh, uh, because of some of the features of C++. Um, one thing to note in these rules of automation, just quickly, is the fact that um, I mentioned that most models uh, their control state would be less than the state data state. The, the one caveat is if you'd have something like a while loop in surrounding an if loop, then you run into a problem because now you have to have your, your, your control state can blow up on you. Um, and that's sort of maybe one of the caveats for using reverse computation. But then again, the solution is we just result back to good old fashioned state saving or actually some incremental state saving to, to get around cases where the code is going to result, the, that control state is going to blow up on us. So then we can just store the, the regular uh, data state. So to what extent is uh, reverse computation, uh, these transformations related to automatic differentiation? Because it seems to have a lot of the same flavor, keeping track of state, the small delta, on top of it. Oh, say that again, Greg, sorry. So automatic differentiation seems to have a lot of the same flavor where they sort of have to go forward and detect some state so that you can do back propagation on top of the gradient they're computed. Absolutely, absolutely. So a, a lot of similarities there. Okay. Um, so, so let's look at this about reversing a random number generator. And this is just a congruential, uh, a combined linear congruential generator. Um, don't worry about all the code, but what you quickly see is there is a lot of destructive assignment stuff happening in this code. Uh, the S variable, K divided by S. Um, and so it really results um, in some potentially degrading the classic state saving, but random number generators are sort of some, some interesting math. Whereas if I look at this particular one, it's based off the function of um, A to the X sub, uh, so this is the set of seeds the um, X values are the set of seeds in the generator. And so I can, we'll, we'll take that times um, an A value, which is the primitive root of the modulo um, uh, uh, variable that we're using M sub I. And so it's, you know, A, A sub I times X sub I comma N sub one mod M, M sub I. And that pushes the, the generator forward to the next seed set. Um, and so that's actually how your random number generator Work so it goes from one seed set to the next seed set of values, um, and it turns out um, it's really cool. You can actually make this perfectly reversible. Um, you can do the math around taking the primitive root to the m sub i minus two power and mod m sub i, and there's actually a way you can do that and keep it in 64 or 32 bits, depending on what your representation is, uh, with some cool number theory. Um, but it turns out that then I can define this B sub I value that literally runs the generator backwards. So if whatever state I'm in, I can, if I know how many forward steps I went, I can just apply the bottom equation and run it back that many steps and re recover exactly where I am in my random uh, generator state space. Um, this isn't the only generator you can do this with in talking with uh, back in the day, uh, Matsumoto and Nishimura who did MT19937. Uh, they believe that, that that generator is probably reversible as well in a sort of similar way. Um, so what other applications can we do beyond this? Um, there's a nice list around uh, folks have done actually Hodgkin-Huxley neuron models. We've done large scale of the internet, plasma physics. Um, 
so Tomas Oppelstrop at Lawrence Livermore has been very interested in kinetic Monte Carlo methods and has a, um, a simulator built on top of a model built on top of Ross called Spock um, that's uh, using uh, reverse computation uh, very efficiently. And then I'll actually introduce a couple of examples um, uh, here in uh, high performance computing network models and spiking neuromorphic uh, uh, stuff as well. There's also, of course, interested in non PDAs, it turns out, in quantum computing, right? All quantum uh, uh, algorithms are perfectly reversible. Uh, there's been interested in really uh, low power computing. So uh, Mike Frank, who's now at Sandia National Labs, had PISA, which was a perfectly reversible instruction set computing. So there's been other activities uh, surrounding this and interest in reverse computation. So this concept of running programs backwards has sort of an undercurrent throughout computer science in, in a lot of ways. Um, all right, so now let's get into ROS and we can sort of uh, go into some of the implementation details and I'll try to pick up the pace a bit. Um, so again, how do we do the local control mechanism? Again, we're targeting a lot of the supercomputers and um, uh, Linux clusters. And again, we, we you know do the reverse computation like I previously indicated. So we use MPI, I send and I receive to send events. Um, we don't use any blocking send or blocking receives. We manage all of our own memory um, and in fact, we actually have uh, under the covers, so there's this question of how do you do event cancellation and how do you match an anti-message to its positive event? We actually store events coming across the wire of pointers to them in an AVL tree. And then when an anti-message comes, we can quickly find them in the AVL tree and cancel and figure out where they are in the system and cancel them. The actual event list itself, we use actually a splay tree for that. Um, um, which is uh, very good for because the, the the top of the list there is always the the, the smallest unprocessed event in the system, uh, but it's actually hard to find individual events in a display tree, which is why we use the AVL tree for the anti-message map. Um, and then the other piece we have discovered is when we're running these large scale models is it's really not um, you you really can't store mapping tables for LP to which core you're on if you have billions of LPs and potentially millions of cores, it's just not possible. So in fact, we actually com use um, uh, computed maps, if you will. So we, we have a calculation that we can use to figure out what the, the mapping uh, should be on the fly. Um, in terms of the global uh, control mechanism for implementing GVT, we use sort of a message counting approach where we actually determine, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, how many messages have been sent and received. And we uh, actually only kick GVT off when memory is low. So we don't do this all the time. Um, but when we do, this is sort of our approach where we're counting messages. We need to make sure that we received all the pending MPI messages under the covers. We actually end up using a MPI all reduce, which is a very optimized collective operation on most uh, supercomputer systems where we sum the sent minus receive. And if it's equal to zero, then we're good to go. Otherwise we have to kind of, there's other messages in the system we need to purge out. Then we'll actually, then everybody chimes in and computes their own uh, local virtual time and reports that out and another all reduce. And the min of all those local virtual times is a GVT. One of the interesting things we found is this algorithm ultimately needs an efficient, of course, collective. And both of these algorithms can be very sensitive to machine and OS jitter. Um, Fortunately, on most of the, many of the supercomputers uh, in existence, um, that's sort of been a solved problem. But on clusters, your performance can can vary a lot because of, of, of any sort of operating system jitter. And you sort of need to take care around that. Um, so Actually, let me ask about that, that issue. If you're talking about a cloud where you have like individual racks, which are reasonably clean, but still have to have like a security layer and then different racks, uh, it's kind of a common network shared across other you know, customers. What does that look like in terms of, you know, the for, for PDS? So that's a great question. We've not, um, that would be a great experiment to run is to understand um, how would that work? I think the the bottom line for PETA is if we can do the, the mapping right and we get the uh, resources um, in sort of a uh, consistent way. So you're, you're not seeing one logic, one sort of, MPI rank, for lack of a better word, being sort of penalized because security or something is running on that particular core at the time. If there's a way 
that you can ensure that everybody's getting a, a good and equal time slice at a, at a relatively quick rate, then you can avoid sort of the, the jitter. So for example, in the case of the Blue Gene Q architecture, right, it carved off all of the operating system functionality to what was then called the 18th, um, or sorry, the 17th core. Um, so if you can do some things like that, then, and you have the bare metal cores, or it could be even running in a virtual uh, machine, but all of those virtual machines are getting the same, relatively at a very low granularity, the same time slice, you should be okay, and it should reduce the sensitivity uh, to any sort of jitter that might be going on in the system. Okay, make sense. Uh, so, um, so with uh, this is the Blue Gene Q uh, system that was at Lawrence Livermore. Um, Greg knows it probably all too well. Um, so, this was a system we did a lot of our a uh, lot of our scaling work on. Uh, where run rack has 1,024 nodes and 16K cores and so on and so forth. Um, the, the interesting thing here is that it's a very balanced architecture and again, very low, S, low um, operating system jitter. Um, and of course it has very, very fast collective operations. So in some sense, this architecture was almost designed to run PDIS incredibly well. And as we'll see, it kind of uh, does that. This is what we did at um, the Sequoia system which is un unfortunately, I love Blue Gene. It just recently went off, um, was retired, but it was probably one of the one of the best supercomputer systems for scaling jobs up that we've seen to date. Um, and in fact, we were one of the few folks to run on what I call Super Sequoia, where it was a full 120 racks. So you literally had nearly two million of those A2 cores I was showing in the previous picture. And of course, it has this uh, five-dimensional torus network. Um, going forward. One of the interesting things we were worried about was when we went from Sequoia, which was pretty balanced as a network, uh, Super Sequoia, they just sort of tacked the machines on in one dimension. They added 24 racks in one dimension. And so it sort of changed the, 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 the structure of the torus uh, where it, it grew in that, in that sort of A dimension, 20 by 16 by 16 by 12 by two from the 16 by 16 above. And so we were worried that bisection bandwidth wasn't going to increase and was that really, was that gonna affect performance? And it turns out it really didn't too much. Um, this is actually the, the, the benchmark we did. It was very pathological. We had you know, 250 million LPs um, with 40 of them mapped per MPI ranked task with 16 events uh, per logical process. 10% of those events were scheduled randomly across the network of this network of LPs. So it's a pretty pathological uh, uh, a benchmark uh, from that perspective. Also, uh, timestamps were exponentially distributed, which means that there's a potential for a zero timestamp increment, meaning you could not run this conservatively. This benchmark would get you zero performance running it conservatively, um, uh, but it runs, as you'll see, pretty well with time warp. These are some of the ROS parameters. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll sort of uh, avoid that. But to just uh, right out of the gate to let you know, the net events process that we were experiencing, we processed 32 trillion events per second, um, uh, uh, sorry, 32 trillion events total. Um, and uh, there's the event rate um, running somewhere around, you know, in 164 billion events per second out to 48 racks. But we were completely deterministic across all of these runs. The number of events process was always the same. And that's another cornerstone that you want to have in your your um, parallel and sequential event models is that when you run the simulation once you run it again, it's deterministic. You get the same number of events processed and the same output results. So when we ran this, we got some good results, um, but we had some uh, problems scaling it beyond 48 racks and it took some sort of magic on the part of IBM and some software fixes, but we finally got it. And what was interesting is we sort of got uh, as you'll see, super linear performance out of this. Again, same deterministic execution, but we were processing at its peak. We took a model on two racks that was taking around 6,000 seconds, scaled it down to 65 seconds. So again, that gives you a perception of what you can, or a feeling of what you can do uh, when you start scaling these things up. And so we're talking, you know, half a trillion events per second, 93% efficiency. Um, so uh, uh, very amazing. Um, and so then we even got super linear performance when you actually 
look at it scaling out from uh, just using two racks. And the bottom line was because we had um, the model, this was a strong scaling model. And so um, when we kept scaling it out, it was all fitting in cash ultimately. So that's another part of the story is if you have a good balanced workload in the model and everything, you can leverage the fact and strong scale things out to leverage the fact that you're getting more and more and more of the model to fit in cash and you could gain that um, additional boost in performance, which is a, a driver for scaling things out to, to even further than you might think otherwise. So uh, definitely a, a benefit for models that you can, you can get this uh, type of performance out of. So again, coming back to our movies um, uh, over the internet, if we just were even processing, you know, before we were talking getting 500 billion events per second, let's say for this model, it's limited to like only 2 billion events per second, which is probably more reasonable given you'd have about a million LPs for such a model. We've taken something that would take you know, years to run on a sequential simulation to down to four and a half hours. So extreme compression. So now it really game changes what you can model, bottom line. All right, so now let's talk about some real applications of this and I'll try to, let's see, looking at time here, uh, pick it up here. So the first is codes. Um, Codes has been this project um, in collaboration with really uh, Rob Ross at Argonne National Labs. He's been the, the one of the lead PIs and, and big advocate for this work where we've been examining how to do exascale storage architectures as well as networks. Um, and it started off really in storage because it turns out if you wanna understand the performance of a storage system and the labs or the facilities don't like you taking the system offline to go run large scale storage benchmarks. So you're gonna basically take over a supercomputer system for a week um, and start running storage benchmarks on it. And so we were looking at, you know, how could we do this in simulation and not have to do that real world uh, experiment in the real hardware. And that was really one of the drivers for this and led to codes. Um, what you see before you is the ability to model torus networks, fat trees, um, various dragonflies and other fly networks. We were also one of the first uh, to have burst buffers and a disk model, as well as workload generation for both synthetic uh, and application traces that we can drive all of these uh, network models and burst buffers together, running over ROS and running in parallel. All of this runs um, optimistically. So just to give you a feel for some of the explorations we've done, we were one of the first to really look at burst buffers and that actually had an impact in terms of the future systems at the time we did this all suddenly started having burst buffers in them because we generally showed that you could have a, a, a lower capable storage system, but if you put burst buffers in, uh, you could gain a lot of that performance back out and you didn't have to have uh, put all that performance into a very expensive storage system. Various scaling studies around a lot of networks, job interference studies, topology studies, um, QoS, congestion management, and so what I wanted to quickly show you was some of the work we did also in, in, in link failures very recently, uh, which is also tends to be a problem that folks see in some of the facilities, which is the driver was is that in facilities, folks want to perform delayed maintenance. It's kind of hard to, to start running long cables across your data center, um, or if you have a whole switch to fail, bring a new switch in. And so sometimes you want to do delayed maintenance on that. And some, certain facilities only do maintenance actually once a month uh, on this. Um, and so then the question is, well, what happens when these uh, uh, link failures happen and how much, how many link failures can you really tolerate across different network fabrics? And in this case, we were considering different uh, plane configurations um, where terminals could have a number of different multiple NICs or rails into those different planes um, across different topologies. And so this is one of the capabilities that the simulation gives you. And then of course we ran it across different workloads. So we took uh, Department of Energy threw up all these traces uh, for us. One of them was algebraic multigrid and there you're seeing the distribution of how it communicates. Another one was um, um, uh, multigrid solver or the multigrid itself. Um, and so we could run that application trace and then throw in some synthetic background traffic at very intensities that you're seeing below and kind of do a what if analysis of across the different networks, how would this um, affect things. And so this gives you a feel for the different uh, uh, configurations we could run for networks. In this case, we were targeting node counts that were sort of about the size of Sierra and Summit, somewhere in those type systems, which are the two leadership class DOE systems right now. Um, 
And so then the, you get the across different topologies. And we could even play around with different networking sort of uh, speed capabilities, whether or not you're talking InfiniBand, EDR, or FDR, um, and do what if around there. In particular, we'll show you could actually have a slower network, but possibly uh, more planes of that network. It's, it's potentially a, a much lower cost, but you could gain um, much greater um, uh, resilience to failures uh, in such a case. Um, we were actually doing different routing algorithms, so progressive adaptive or just straight adaptive across those different uh, topologies. And just sort of the, the bottom line was is that we could have multiple rails. And so you're seeing this is for the AMG, for the Dragonfly 1D network. And um, if we add multiple rails, we can tolerate even up to 90% of a single plane link and still keep pretty good performance relative to lower scale failures. So that would be pathological to have, you know, 50, 60, 70% of the network fail, but you get a sense of what that does to communication. And then obviously above this, we would have, um, there was no longer paths for this model above about 50%. So you couldn't even run, run it on a single rail. Um, in the Megafly case, sort of a similar story where we're seeing uh, multiple rails, even at um, uh, lower, uh, 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 bandwidth capabilities, so EDR, was performing very well for the most part, even compared to its um, uh, um, FDR, uh, or e FDR is comparing very well to its EDR counterpart. Um, so the bottom line takeaway is that um, we should really pay attention to these uh, types of, of networks and give some, you know, uh, uh, some, some sort of do here around uh, including resilience is part of the story when you're considering uh, the overall cost of networks. One of the things that we're seeing a trend, at least on the HPC side, is they're worried about just bottom line cost of the network. But there's no real consideration, I think, at least at this point, that we're seeing that folks are considering uh, what are the what's the you know when you're going to maintain the system, what's the cost of the, of those failures, and should maybe uh, more uh, uh, topologies with higher path diversity. Um, or more planes uh, possibly went out in, in supporting those uh, uh, large uh, leadership class systems. So now I quickly want to talk about the next one, which was uh, the NEMO system, which this gets into neuromorphic uh, computing. So again, uh, very quickly, neuromorphic computing is a radical departure from what's called the stored program uh, computer, where essentially we're modeling are taking biologically inspired neural network models and realizing them in hardware. So there's no ALU and there's not a memory per se and all of those components go away and you end up with sort of a large neural net realized in silicon. And I'm showing sort of two instances that, uh, in pictures. One is the IBM True North chip and the other down below is Lohi, which is from Intel. And again, the, the goal of this hardware is to, to really re significantly reduce the energy. So for example, um, when uh, True North came out, it ran in something like 65 milliwatts of power. Um, there's actually even promises to even go even much lower uh, and possibly go into the uh, 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 microwatt uh, range or hundreds of microwatt range with this type of, of style of computing. So again, these are the type of neuromorphic models that we could begin to support, which they start off with Hodgkin Huxley on the left. You can go in to get a more reduced um, but continuous model with Ishkovich, and then you can get into a leaky integrate and fire model, which is more of a spiking, uh, non-continuous style model. And uh, what's sort of interesting about this is there's been this big debate going on between spiking con uh, versus continuous model, um, and sort of who's going to win. One of the interesting thing is, you know, every time there's sort of an arms race, the the spiking folks show that you know they can do as as good with as the continuous. Folks, but then the continuous folks keep you know, uh, uh, moving things forward on their side as well. So there's this really interesting, I think, uh, tr uh, sort of tug of war happening in the the, the space. Um, what Nemo is is it's sort of this framework for playing around with these ideas. Currently, it's really geared toward looking at spiking uh, uh, models. In fact, on the on the right there, you're seeing the IBM True North chip. Um, a couple of things we had to sort of solve with this to get it to scale up. One is uh, with these models, the synapses kind of grow uh, to being very, very large and dominating the system. So we actually had to have a way to group 
grouped them all together, and we created a sort of super synapse model. The other um, innovation here that we had to do was sort of a scalable approach to dealing with event fan out, meaning when these models fire, you could have you know hundreds of of, of events being sent out to other neurons in the system. And that's not even getting close to how our brain work brain brain works. The brain is capable of sending, you know, the fan outs are like a order a hundred thousand in the middle, sort of the corpus callosum of the brain. So dealing with this fan out and keeping the event population down turned out to be uh, a real challenge. So we developed a scalable fan out approach um, that kept the event population in check uh, going forward. Um, in terms of performance, Again, we're able to use the blue gene and other supercomputers to scale this out to really uh, crazy large models. In this case, we're able to model things like over 4 billion neurons and a quadrillion synapses. Again, the trick there is, is we're not modeling each and every little uh, uh, connection between the synapses like you would normally do. We're modeling uh, strictly the fact that they sort of exist and we're sending messages uh, between them. And so, but we're able to uh, scale these up and get you know, billions, tens of billions of events per second uh, and scale to, you know, very large uh, configurations. So then what's an application of this? And so we wanted to do this sort of what if design study around the idea um, of, and I'll finish this up of, well, what if we had a, a true north processor on every node inside of a supercomputer? And then how would that impact um, regular HPC workloads running inside of a computer? So we could say, well, you know, if you had a bunch of neuromorphic applications all running alongside of traditional HPC, how would that work, work uh, look like? And so you're seeing our workflow here where we actually took the true north uh, set of tools and were able to pull out and train real neuromorphic models, then in fact scale those models up inside of Nemo um, and then feed that data into our code simulator and do this sort of uh, what if interference study. Um, these were the networks that we did, Fat Tree, Dragonflies, and Slimfly. Slimfly is a theoretical network um, from uh, Torsten uh, Heffler's group from ETH, um, very low diameter network. And, um, but these are also um, other uh, uh, competing networks as well. Um, so now you're seeing the application workloads just very quickly. We did a number of neuromorphic workloads, the MNIST, handwriting, SciFAR, uh, a hot field network. Um, and then, of course, the this, this standard sort of um, uh, DOE benchmarks, crystal router, algebraic multigrid, solver, and multigrid. And those are their uh, communication uh, patterns that you're seeing. So the question is, is how do these patterns all uh, affect each other? And sort of the big summary of this is, you know, what happens in terms of overall slowdown? What we found is um, MNIST itself would experience a pretty good slowdown uh, in the presence of AMG of nearly a third um, or tw over 25% on a 1D dragonfly, but only about 9%. It was very strange with AMG. It would actually get faster, and we think there was something with the progressive adaptive routing actually helping it out, um, as well as maybe its position within the overall dragonfly uh, network. Um, but overall, these are types of uh, illustrative studies that we're able to do. And just sort of to end the talk, and I think... I'm just a minute over and I apologize, but um, there's sort of a, several things we want to investigate across these topics. In Ross, um, and I talked a lot about Blue Gene Q, but it turns out Blue Gene R is available, but it's called uh, Fukuku uh, from uh, uh, Japan at Riken. So it's the number one supercomputer in the world using an ARM processor, but that processor has a lot of similarities to the Blue Gene Q processor. Um, uh, so that's one of the things we'd love to be able to do and looking forward to being able to do is that machine becomes more available um, and maybe other machines like it. Um, the other thing we're working on is, is user event cancellation. Uh, that's needed by the folks at uh, Livermore for their Kinetic Monte Carlo uh, uh, simulation. We're also interested in doing some uh, cloning of the models themselves to have to stop re-simulating essentially everything you do before you run into something interesting. Um, and uh, in, in we're doing a design of experiment study. Um, um, the other piece I want to point out was uh, Ross is being used by a company I'm affiliated with and it's kind of, I guess, in, in, in full disclosure, uh, Lucid.ai has its Avicenna pandemic modeling framework where it's modeling uh, COVID-19, uh, 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 the virus spread um, across the entire U.S. and, is, and as well as part of uh, Europe and is looking for 
for um, moving into, uh, I think, Russia and other places as well. Uh, my former uh, PhD student, David Bauer, um, is leading that work, and Ross is the underlying uh, simulation uh, approach for that. And so we're working, or I'm going to be working to, of course, improve that parallel performance uh, for that model as well. In terms of codes, we're going to be investigating some new uh, QoS and congestion management. And of course, because of Fugaku, we're now interested in revisiting Taurus models. Um, in terms of uh, Nemo's work, uh, we're interested in considering other neuromorphic uh, capabilities, meaning a job scheduler written in uh, uh, for a neuromorphic hardware. Meaning if we look at these systems as they exist today, you can get a true north chip or a low heat chip, but they're just the chip. Uh, on low heat, you can do on chip training, but there's no scheduling services. If you want scheduling services, you need a full CPU off to the side. So as opposed to having to do, you know, ruin the power efficiency by adding a CPU to a neuromorphic processor, there's an open question around, well, can't we add sort of job scheduling and other system functionality, but do it within the neuromorphic hardware um, already in existence? And we have some initial results that we're working on there already. And then the last piece that we're doing is considering new hardware devices themselves um, and how that impacts power. In particular, I'm working with a colleague from UIUC, uh, Shalu Rajahaya, uh, on antiferromagnetic uh, devices and how they could be used uh, to uh, improve the power efficiency of uh, potential neuromorphic designs. So I went a little over. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. And i um, happy to take some questions. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was fast forward. Thank you very much, Chris. Hey, thank you so much, Greg. And thanks to everybody attending. I really appreciate it.